Imagine standing here with me, surrounded by this vast dry desert, and realizing that 248 million years ago, at this location, in the middle of nowhere in Utah, you would be underwater at the bottom of a vast, shallow inlet sea, extending deep into the western coast of Pangaea, extending for hundreds of miles northward into Idaho and down south into Arizona, where it opened up into a vast ocean. The sea left behind more than just rocks. It recorded the aftermath of the most catastrophic event in Earth's history, the end Permian mass extinction, when most of marine life vanished. Join me in another adventure of the rocks of Utah, this time looking for fossils in the incredible Triassic Thanes limestone of Utah. All right, you see this, these outcrops over here? They're coming up. That's where we're going to be headed. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of the strata down in uh, this low area over here. And uh, there's some Triassic rocks that are exposed over there. A lot of Paleozoic rocks around here. Behind me, we have a lot of Cambrian rocks. Um, we'll have a lot of Permian and Pennsylvanian rocks. Um, but there's, there's some really cool areas of the uh, Triassic that pop up here and there in, uh, in this region that we're in. All right, I'm trying to find this road. So I'm heading east again. And I want to go north, and I want to go out to those uh, those outcrops over there of the Thanes Formation. So I'm going to go back out in the main road, go back up, and see if I can get into there. There supposedly is a road that can go right out there, but I'm having a tough time finding it. <laughs> Wild horses. Out there is some nice Mustang. Boy, look at that view. There they go. This looks like Triassic stuff where they're running. One of the things I hate about this uh, Thanes formation is it's structurally so complicated. Ooh. Uh, so all these blocks have been knocked down and tossed around, so sometimes it's difficult to see if these are completely overturned in this valley here, so it is a little tricky. Correct. There we go. It's clear and yeah, I'm gonna have to check. They have pretty good grooves on them, so that's kind of cool. So hopefully I can find some ammonites along here. But we do have some fossils. It's a rock with a bunch of uh, shells in it. You can see right here. Just chock full of shelly organisms. Maybe some ammonites. <laughs> Gotta find a good ammonite, one that's like very clearly an ammonite. These I think are all bivalves, other shelly organisms. This is beautiful. So there's there's the bivalve there. And you can see this is uh, the other one. It broke and it's been sitting here in the desert 
for a very long time exposing this little fossil here. Uh, both sides of it. Just beautiful. A whole fossil. So you can see this limestone is just full of these little bivalves. Um, here's a cross section and you can see, if you look really closely, you can see that there are these little kind of scallop shaped cross sections of all the little shells. And then this one we're looking on the, the surface and you can see all of these like little bumps here represent little, little pieces of shell, uh, probably some bunch of uh, bivalve shells that are kind of composing this limestone. So it's it's really cool to see to see this. Um, this is a very kind of healthy ocean. Um, a lot of organisms living in this and, and forming this limestone uh, from their skeletons. This is like a pack stone, I guess. These are kind of cool. I, I'm puzzled by them, but they're they're bivalves. You can see in the cross section, and then different different patterns here in the limestone. So all these pretty big bivalves. So this is kind of cool. We got a, a facies change here. So over here we have um, our beautiful limestones, and then as we move up in section, we see we then have this sandstone, kind of a fine fine grain sandstone. We can see even some cross bedding going on. So these are more sandy facies, um, still probably marine. It's interesting to see that cross bedding. It's very laminated, it's sort of cross bedding, probably close to wave base, which is pretty cool to see. And then we have, of course, the, the carbonate limestones over here. And so we see this kind of shoaling up of the environment. And uh, really nice to see this difference that we're seeing in terms of the geology. Surfaces like this are kind of interesting. So you can see that this is just full of uh, bivalve shells that are composing this limestone um, in here. And you can see like all of these little little signs of life it's these rocks are kind of bubbling with life which is kind of neat to see before this time a strange island rose out of the sea to the east what Michael from Vsauce jokingly called the ancient Yoshi nugget land it was formed by the remains of the uplift of the ancestral Rocky Mountains from the Pennsylvanian and Permian periods. This island eroded outward into the shallow sea, creating a unique setting of tidal flats that eventually narrowed the inlet between the sea and the open ocean. This was accelerated with the uplift of central Arizona in the Middle Triassic called the Mongol Highlands, which began to choke off this access to the open ocean to the south. This sea would eventually give way to a giant inland basin by the late Triassic called the Chinle Basin. However, today we are interested in the deposits of this large inlet seaway called the Bay of Thanes and the Virgin Inlet that extended across central Utah. So I'm not particularly happy because they've come all this way and who is here but gnats? It's May 9th, this is insane. I've never seen gnats out this early. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just squished one in my forehead. Yeah, they're these little bugs that bite you. Not too bad, but I imagine out here in probably a few days, maybe a few weeks, it's going to get worse. And uh, we're still in the first half of, of May, so uh, yeah, this is crazy. The dystopian world that followed Earth's greatest mass extinction the early Triassic period, once known as the Scythian Age, was a time of recovery and instability. The name Scythian was borrowed from the ancient group of Central Asiatic horsemen, 
nomadic warriors who relied on speed and mobility to conquer vast regions. It was in Central Asia that the geological age was first recognized. However, the Scythian cultural legacy, fragmented, mobile, resistant horse-riding warriors, is a fitting metaphor for this chaotic time in Earth's history. Historically, the early Triassic was divided into stages using ammonite fossils, but those early subdivisions often overlapped between regions and were inconsistent across continents. Over time, a revised framework took shape. Geologists divide the early Triassic into two major stages, the Indian and the Olnikian. The Indian is further divided into the Geshbakian and the Denarian sub-stages, while the Olnikian is divided into the Smithian and Spathian. The shift from ammonites to conodont fossils, a more globally consistent microfossil, enabled tighter correlations. A global boundary stratotype section and point, a GSSP, in China was established using conodonts, helping standardize the base of the Triassic across the world. Even so, debates continue, fossil pre preservation varies widely, and regional stratigraphy still complicates efforts to define global timelines. The Scythian Age, as it was once known, is now understood through four key intervals, the Gespachian, the Denarian, the Smithian, and the Spathian. During the early Triassic, the biosphere struggled to recover. Life was sparse, ecosystems unstable. The fossil record from this period reflects both the aftermath of the destruction and the first signs of reorganization. The Thanes limestone captures a unique window into the Smithian age of the early Triassic. This formation preserves marine life in the wake of mass extinction, but not directly afterward, a few million years into this new era, the Mesozoic era. The limestone stretched across central Utah up into Idaho and western Wyoming, deposited in a broad, shallow inlet that extended into what was once the ancestral western margin of Pangaea. To the west were the early rises of the Severe Arch and the Sonoma Highlands, and to the east the remains of the southern ancestral Rockies, and between them a marine bay, the Bay of Thanes. Named in 1907 after Thanes Canyon near Park City, the formation consists primarily of limestone, though it sometimes grades into sandstone. Structurally, it's complex, lifted and folded by earlier compressional forces, then broken apart by extensional faulting over the last 30 million years. Today it appears as isolated blocks and tilted layers across the Basin and Range province. This region of western Utah was subjected to amazing tectonic forces during the Mesozoic until today. First, it was compressed, riding over the Pacific tectonic plates like a bulldozer, folding the rock layers into gigantic folds called anaclines and synclines, crumpling up the layers of rocks like a crushed aluminum can. The folds became so extreme here that they formed vertical folds, crumpled upon themselves, and among the layers of resistant limestone was a thin claystone and mudstone layer called the Woodside Formation, representing the earliest Triassic and PT boundary layer. This layer proved an excellent surface for the slippage between the more resistant, harder limestone layers above and below. Hence, the vertical folds of the Thane's limestone slumped downward along the surface. As they did so, they detached from the layers below in these horizontal folds, folding downward in another complex folding pattern. This structural geology confused geologists mapping this region, so much so that they called this area Confusion Range. Today we're focusing on the Smithian portion of the Thanes limestone, more specifically the zones defined by the ammonites like Mycoceras and Ancipiorites. 
These are among the few groups that show notable diversity in the early Triassic. While most marine invertebrates like brachiopods and corals and crinoids saw dramatic declines in diversity, cephalopods like ammonites recovered more quickly. Ammonites were highly adapted for survival. Their buoyant coiled shells allowed them to navigate the open water column, adjusting depth through gas exchange between chambers, tentacles likely protruding from their shell opening supported by advanced vision and jet propulsion through a siphon. This allowed them to move effectively and react to their environment. Unlike modern nautiloids, which are more generalized feeders, early Triassic ammonites seem to have been specialized planktonic feeders. Their radiata, the rows of comb-like teeth, filtered phytoplankton from the water. This implies a quick rebound of photosynthetic microplankton in the oceans, marking the early reestablishment of marine food webs. Ammonites were mobile, and they could migrate. If, as temperatures and water chemistry fluctuated in nearshore environments, these animals likely retreated to the deeper and cooler offshore waters. Seasonal phytoplankton blooms may have drawn them back into shallow inlets like the Bay of Thames. This movement helped them survive and track food availability across unstable environments. In some layers of the Thanes limestone, mass death assemblages of ammonites have been discovered, large accumulations that hint at population densities and widespread seasonal migration. These assemblages challenge the perception of the early Triassic as biologically empty. Instead, they suggest a slow but measured recovery, with ammonites playing a leading role in the rebuilding of marine ecosystems. New fossil discoveries from the Thanes limestone in Idaho also include shrimp-like arthropods and other crustaceans, and these organisms likely form the mid-level links in the food web feeding on phytoplankton and serving as prey for larger swimming animals. The presence of all this life in these plagiatic uh, ecosystems, uh, where you have the open ocean, were already beginning to function again. Mobility, migration, filter feeding, these were all kind of clear, clear uh, adaptations in this new marine world. The sessile reefs of the Permian were over, and the open ocean was the new frontier. While much of the early Triassic remains enigmatic, um, the fossil record of the Thanes limestone shows that life, though reduced, was not extinguished. Slowly, steadily, ecosystems begin to rebuild, and here in these limestone beds, we can trace the earliest evidence, the earliest signs of this recovery.